Good morning, good afternoon. Again, I'd like to welcome everyone here. For those of you that just hopped on, we're so glad you could make it. Let's get started. We have a great presentation for you today, but before we begin, I just want to go over a couple of features you all can utilize during the webinar. First, feel free to utilize the question feature. Anytime you have a question throughout the presentation, please ask it through the questions tab. The second feature you all can utilize is the poll. We will ask a poll question later in the presentation and we encourage you to participate. The last thing I want to mention is that this webinar will be recorded. So if you would like to watch it again or share this presentation with someone, a link will be provided in a follow-up email later today or on our website. I'm Leslie Bruns and I will be your host today. A little bit about myself, I was raised in the Midwest on a chain of lakes in Northwest Wisconsin. I spent my summers in New Orleans by the Mississippi River and I'm now a proud Arizonian. I like to think I've seen just about every type of water body. When it comes to lake management, I'm dedicated to helping lake and pond owners cultivate water bodies that exceed their goals. I'm passionate about preserving the health and beauty of aquatic ecosystems which fuels my commitment to continuous training and education. I'm regularly working with property managers, municipalities, golf courses, and landowners to identify natural strategies that are both eco-friendly and affordable, while we work with them to create customized plans that target their unique lake or pond needs. Next, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Wes Allen. Wes has extensive experience managing lakes stormwater ponds, and environmentally sensitive areas for community associations and municipalities. He is committed to utilizing holistic natural management practices whenever possible and regularly educates his clients about the long-term benefits of proactive management. His knowledge of modern shoreline restoration methods, nutrient mitigation strategies, holistic water quality balancing techniques, and other natural solutions makes him a valuable resource for stakeholders everywhere. We will hear from Wes later on. I would like to let all of you know, there will be a feedback survey at the end of our Q&A session today. One lucky survey participant will receive a Solitude swag bag. For questions we don't get to today, or questions that come in after the webinar, rest assured we will film a second Q&A and have those answers emailed out to you next week. We have a great webinar planned for you all. Let's get started. First, I'd like to run through our agenda. We will begin with understanding your complex water resource. We'll go over what different strategies and approaches we use to best understand each unique water body. We'll talk about preserving and restoring water resources and what that requires. Next, we'll cover the goals of lake and pond management. At Solitude, we thrive on finding holistic approaches to maintaining the health and beauty of the water body, hoping to avoid reactive solutions, which can lead to harsher approaches to treating the problem. Staying ahead of the water body's health not only helps keep it sustainable, but also can stay within an understood budget. Following that, Wes will cover 10 natural management solutions from fisheries to dredging, erosion control to aeration, just to name a few. Wes's 20 years of experience really shine when he starts sharing his wealth of knowledge on these topics. You'll probably want the popcorn out for this part. Next, I will jump back in to discuss implementing a holistic annual management plan. I'll share the importance of being proactive and what perks come along with deciding on an annual management plan all of our plans are customizable and bring to your water body a team of dedicated professionals, a customer support team, and many behind the scenes experts that work every day to make sure Solitude's lakes and ponds goals are being met in the most holistic way possible. In closing, we will open the discussion up for questions and answers. Again, feel free to send your questions in along the way. We'll do our best to answer them. Again, if we miss them, a second Q&A will be filmed and emailed out to you next week. Now, before we begin, we want to know what your water quality issue is by taking a quick poll. Go ahead, 
and click on what comes to mind the most when thinking about your lake, pond, or water quality questions. Just give you a couple more seconds. All right, it looks like all of the issues were selected with LG Blooms and all of the above coming in with a tie for the most votes. Don't worry, we will dive into each of these topics and hopefully get you some answers or spike your interest into more questions that you can shoot our way as we go. Thanks for participating in that poll. Understanding your complex water resource. Preserving and restoring water resources is so complex. It requires a diverse and adaptive management approach. No two water bodies are the same, just like people. We all have a unique chemistry that takes understanding, dedication, and care to create a holistic, successful plan. Knowing every water body is different is important to understand. We need to understand the environment. We need to understand what surrounds your water body. Whether landscaping is an issue, farm runoff, or other harsh conditions are the culprit, it brings vital topics to the table when understanding what your water body lives through. The number one way to understanding your water body is through testing. We offer amazing, top of the line water quality tests that is broken down into a readable, attractive report that is easy to understand and share with the decision makers. Our reports come not only with results, but with observations and recommendations for solutions. Next, what are the purposes of your water body? Is it a recreational lake, a stormwater pond, a decorative pond, a fishing pond? What are your goals? This is where the dreams come in. What does that perfect day by the water body look like to you? What's involved? Fishing, enjoying the serenity of staring at your fountains, water clarity, a beautiful day at the golf course maybe, just to name a few thoughts. And most importantly, budget. We work with our clients to meet their goals while meeting their budget. These factors will affect the way you approach your management and how we can best plan to achieve success, meet your goals, and help you rest assured your lakes are in good hands. The goal of lake and pond management. When managing a lake or pond, the goal is to implement the best strategies. Well, understanding goals. Again, what's the end goal? And do you have that perfect vision in mind? Budget conscious. When thinking about budget, it's most certainly about what's most important to you. What's most vital? If a project is out of budget, how can we create phases that are feasible? and environmental sustainability. Without being too punny, this is the nature of our business. We strive to be environmentally sustainable with any projects we take on and any lake management relationships we build. And effectiveness and results. What is management if we aren't looking at the effectiveness and results? It's so important to us to stay in front of potential issues measure our results based on performance, and most importantly, your lake experts should be communicating with you consistently. There are always solutions available to meet your needs. Knowing you have a team behind you is key. You can always rely on your technician you see on site and your business development consultant who's an email or phone call away. As a Solitude family, we meet consistently to make sure we are finding the right solutions for all of the unique water body needs we face. Our team uses EPA registered herbicides and algicides. In some cases, EPA registered solutions are the only solutions or cost effective solutions that can effectively restore a water body with severe water quality issues. Highly selective herbicides are available to target specific aquatic weeds. Several products are even approved for direct application to potable drinking water 
have organic certifications or were approved as a reduced risk product by the EPA. It's important to implement proactive management early on to avoid the need to rely on temporary solutions. Falling back to the idea of being proactive versus reactive. Sometimes we have to take a reactive approach to achieve a solution to a tough problem. But once we have found that solution, we can work on preventative planning so we can continue with our most holistic approach. But there are many natural strategies that can be implemented instead of or simultaneously with chemical products. Now, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Wes Allen, who will go over 10 natural management solutions. Welcome, Wes. Welcome, everybody. Uh, Leslie, thank you for the introduction and getting us started here. Um, it's great to join you guys this morning or afternoon, depending on where you're at. Today, we're going to be talking about 10 natural management solutions. Now, these natural management solutions may not represent all the solutions that are out there. They represent a good mix, and they're not really ranked in order of importance from beginning uh, to end. Uh, but it's important to remember the first step to providing any of these solutions is, like Leslie said, really diving in and analyzing your water body. That can be from water testing to sediment testing to maybe even bathymetry testing, which is a fancy way of saying mapping your pond bottom so we know the volume, what sediment's there. A lot of people think of water quality and they just think about the chemical makeup of what's in the water, but it's also important to realize that, you know, the soil and sediment underneath your water also make up part of that system. And the nutrient transfer between that sediment and the water can actually lead to a lot of your problems. Um, the key term to think about when we're talking about any of this, any aquatic management, is uh, aquatic secession. And particularly with man-made water bodies, water bodies tend to over time become shallower and more eutrophic or more full of nutrients. So these 10 natural management solutions help to uh, help us restore some of that balance into your water body. Um, you know, I like to think of pond and lake management and try to break it down simply as, uh, you know, comparing it to automobile maintenance. We all know with a automobile, a car, you have to go in and get the oil changed and there's certain mileage where you refix certain things. Well, you know, your pond's the same way, you know, by putting the maintenance in and the management in, you can reduce some of those capital costs and keep that car running longer and more efficiently. So the first natural management solution that we're going to talk about today is aeration. Uh, and it's no wonder we're talking about aeration first. Again, it's not ranked in order of importance, but aeration, from the name, obviously, it's bringing in oxygen into your water column, you know, dissolved oxygen. Um, aeration is a great tool because it often helps with some of the other things we're gonna talk about later because adding dissolved oxygen to your pond uh, just makes everything run more efficiently. So if you're talking about car maintenance, for example, this would be like adding a, a turbocharger to your engine. You're basically putting more oxygen into the engine or the, the, into the lake or water body, and you're basically helping everything run smoother. Now, it's a common misconception, as you can see on the picture there, uh, aeration pumps, uh, you know, compressed uh, air into your pond. It forms bubbles that flow from the bottom to the top. And a lot of people think it's those bubbles that are actually adding the dissolved oxygen to the water column. Well, with traditional aeration, that isn't the case. It's actually the lifting from the bottom of the pond to the top, bringing that colder water from the bottom to the top, breaking that surface tension. You have more transfusion of, of oxygen into your water column. Now, oxygen is very important, helps to cycle nutrients, helps for beneficial bacteria, improves, you know, your fishery, uh, you know, by cycling the nutrients quicker, you know, you, you can create less algae blooms and get rid of a lot of those nutrients that cause the algae blooms. Um, aeration also, there's a, a lot of new and exciting technologies coming out with aeration. There's nanobubble and direct oxygen saturation technology. This is slightly different. These are tiny little bubbles that actually stay on the bottom of your pond and actually directly add oxygen particularly to that sediment and uh, that, that soil and water uh, interface there on the bottom of your pond where a lot of the nutrients can be released up into your pond by adding dissolved oxygen in there, you actually help to break that cycle out and get rid of a lot of that available nitrogen and phosphorus, particularly phosphorus that cause algae blooms. Uh, so the next thing we're going to talk about after aeration is putting mother nature to work for us, uh, beneficial buffers. Um, beneficial bu buffers are one of my favorites. I love I love plants and that plants do a lot of wonderful things. So we can think about all the changes that we've made to our landscape, you know, through development and over time. Uh, basically what uh, beneficial buffers do is it's adding native and other veg native plant vegetation uh, to stabilize your embankment. Uh, stabilization obviously helps to stop erosion. Uh, 
the, you know, the EPA passed the Clean Water Act in the 70s, and they quickly realized that it wasn't just point source pollution that was causing water issues. The actual number one pollutant of water is sediment. That sediment, uh, you know, all carries a lot of nutrients that cause those harmful algal blooms and other issues in the lakes and ponds. Uh, so by adding a beneficial buffer, you can help to break that cycle. The plants, again, the plant root and the plant material actually help to stabilize the embankments. They filter nutrient runoff coming directly uh, from, from the uh, surface of the surrounding area. Uh, and not only that, they can be beautiful. Uh, this picture here, for example, this is pickerel weed. Pickerel weed is a great plant. Uh, it's not great everywhere. It's, you know, you know, again, we have to pick what's best for buffer for you and what's native in your area. Um, and, but provides, uh, you know, flowers and uh, habitat for pollinators, uh, places for some of the beneficial bacteria we're going to talk about later, uh, fish habitat, et cetera. Um, and also buffers can help to, you know, form a buffer for, you know, some of the other problems we have with resident Canada geese and other issues. Um, so a buffer, again, if you're talking about the car analogy, is kind of like cleaning your air filter. You know, it helps to filter out some of those impurities from getting into your pond and causing issues. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is, again, still putting Mother Nature to work for us. Biological augmentation, so beneficial bacteria. Uh, beneficial bacteria, enzymes, and other micronutrients. Uh, basically, these already exist in your pond, and they already exist on us. Uh, obviously, we've had bacteria on our skin and in our body that works with us in a symbiotic relationship. A lot of the bacteria on our hands has taken a beating over the last year, as we know, with all the hand sanitizing we've been doing. But by adding beneficial bacteria to your pond, you can actually help to improve the, the function of that system. You can reduce muck. You know, muck is the organic debris and leaves and et cetera that you know, build up in your pond over time, like we talked about with that aquatic secession. Beneficial bacteria can help to break that down. That muck also has a lot of the nutrients that cause some of the algae blooms and pond weeds and other issues. So this beneficial bacteria, by augmenting and putting it in your pond, you can help to break that layer down and you know have maybe less cost on the on the back end with maybe hydro raking or dredging or et cetera. Um, this bacteria also works great, particularly in the enzymes and micronutrients when you're adding aeration. Uh, so again, uh, uh, from the car uh, maintenance analogy, the beneficial bacteria you can look at as adding a, a fuel additive to your engine so that, you, that the, uh, your car runs cleaner and smoother. Um, so again, you know, putting that to work for you can really help to improve the life, and water life of your water body and reduce that muck layer. The next thing we're going to talk about is again, a natural, a natural compound, uh, it's biochar. Um, Biochar was first used in the, the uh, plant industry. Uh, it's a activated carbon um, product. So uh, we all know activated carbon is used in the plant industry because it can hold nutrients longer. Um, it's, you know, it also used in the you know, poison control. If somebody's ever been poisoned and called poison control, a lot of times activated charcoal is used to absorb, absorb some of those poisons. So we can look at our picture here. Uh, biochar actually comes in socks. They can be installed in inlets like you see on the on the two pictures there, or they can be installed on a float and put right in your water column. Now basically biochar is activated carbon, it has a ton of carbon molecules, and that carbon molecule provides a place for things to attach. Um, and that way we can attach those nutrients and heavy metals and other pollutants from your pond and attach to the biochar. We can pull it out, remove that from the water column, and uh, you know, replace that with new with new biochar material when the time comes. Uh, we can use that to really reduce the, the nutrients and heavy metals and some other pollutants in your ponds in some cases. And in, in some places you can actually recycle this and put it into compost or into gardening or anything like that. So it, it's a great sustainable product. Um, again, back, back to the car analogy, again, I like just try to you know, weave it in there so we all understand. So biochar is kind of like the catalytic converter on your car. So in your muffler, you know, your, your car produces a certain amount of exhaust uh, well, the catalytic converter helps to, you know, chemically bind with some of that and make it cleaner coming out of your exhaust. This is a, kind of the same thing. It's, it's cleaning that water body or taking out some of those impurities that you want to take out. Uh, the next thing we want to talk about is another product that really targets, really targets nutrients in your pond, and that's Foslock. Now, Foslock is a great material. It's a, it's a lanthanum clay. It's a natural product. Uh, it's a clay material that, again, it, it, it has a you know ion, ionic charge that actually specifically attracts free reactive phosphorus, forms a covalent bond that can't be broken. It turns that free reactive phosphorus or the phosphorus that that algae needs to grow 
uh, into a mineral format that can't be used. Uh, you can see from the picture, um, it can be used in, in large reservoir drinking water systems, uh, and it can be applied in a slurry like you see coming out of that pipe where it's actually filtering all through the water column. Um, you, you can apply it just to get the phosphorus out of the water column, or you can actually do a full reset, which again, we talked about how important that sediment layer was in the bottom of your pond. You can actually add enough FOSLOC to sort of cap that and reduce that phosphorus transfer from the sediment. Uh, again, it specifically targets phosphorus, and that's really important for us. That's the number one limiting, number one limiting nutrient that causes algae growth. And for years, uh, you know, back in the day, there wasn't really a great understanding of fertilization. So everybody always looked at uh, nitrogen and they used natural fertilizers like manure. And nitrogen is super volatile. Well, phosphorus is not. So there's a ton of phosphorus laying around in that silt and sediment layers in a lot of our water bodies and a lot of our soil, uh, particularly if it was an ag heavy area. So phosphorus is a great way to target that specific uh, phosphorus uh, molecule. And again, phosphorus, again, kind of like the catalytic converter. Uh, it does it does a great job at filtering that material out. Um, the next slide we're going to talk about is fish stocking uh, for biological control. Um, so this this is one of the ones, and, and all, everything really we have to look at the jurisdiction to see whether things need to be permanent or not. But with this fish stocking in particular, permitting is very uh, important because some of the fish that I'm going to talk about are not going to be available, or or you're going to need a permit or might not even be available in your jurisdiction. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is that fish that you see directly on your screen there, and that is a triploid grass carp. Now what triploid means, it means three chromosomes. So these fish cannot breed. Uh, it's important that they don't breed because these fish can last a long time. And while you might wanna target the aquatic weeds in your pond, uh, some of these aquatic weeds and other natural systems might be something that they wanna propagate. For example, you cannot stock these in the state of Maryland because the Chesapeake Bay program once submerged veg aquatic vegetation. Uh, so these triploid grass carp are, are great. Uh, they don't eat everything. So it's not like you can put these in and they're gonna eat all the algae and all their bad problems. They really, you have to specifically, you know, identify the weed problem to see whether these are gonna work for you. But if stocked correctly, they can eat 70% to 100% of your weed problem, you know, pretty quickly um, and control that pretty well. So again, it's important to understand uh, these triploid grass carp, sometimes on the West Coast, you know, for my West Coast listeners, sometimes they're called white amur. It's the same thing. Um, but again, permitting is very important for this and also knowing what kind of weed you're targeting. The second fish I want to talk about is one of my favorites. It's a tiny little fish, but it's done a lot of uh, good for the humankind. It's called the Gambese fish or mosquito fish. It's one of the best biological controls for mosquito known to man. They're really cool little fish. They're live bearers. They're related to guppies, so they have their young live. So their survival rate is really, really good. Um, they reproduce really quickly. They can live in a variety of, of water uh, quality conditions. They're pretty tough little fish, but again, they really go after those mosquito larvae. Uh, even aeration can help with mosquito because mosquito larvae are snorkel breathers and you break the surface tension, you can really help to reduce your uh, mosquito larvae, uh, mosquito hatching coming from your pond. But again, just like the triploid grass carp, uh, mosquito fish might not be available in every jurisdiction. So it's important to understand whether they're available and what kind of permits you need to get those to put to work for your pond. Uh, so some of the next, uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is a erosion control product. So again, I've been really involved and really uh, interested in my career and some of these erosion control solutions. I really like putting mother nature to work uh, for you with those plantings and uh, the SOX erosion solution is a great way to give those plants a leg up. So erosion, like we talked about, can, it can do a lot of things. It can fill your pond in quicker, so you need to, to dredge quicker. It can reduce property values. It can cause damage to your shoreline. You know, you could, you know, really cause structural issues down the road uh, if it erodes uh, too quickly. So socks, you can think of it as kind of like a big, a big fabric taco where we lay the, the fabric out and then we fold it back on itself and we can fill that with fill. We can even use fill from dredging or hydro raking. Uh, in some situations, but we can't use it all the time. So it's important to, you know, we have to check that soil to see whether it's gonna work or not, but it can be something that can be used in conjunction. So basically socks is a fabric that you can, again, fill with that backfill there, and then you basically plant it, and it, you can plant directly in it, plants can grow directly in it. So over time, you get uh, the protection from the sock, but you get the, the vegetation putting that back to work, and you can use sod, or you can use the some of the beneficial buffer plantings that we talked about, whether that's in the shallow water or 
riparian areas with the flowering plants or other things, depending on the situation. But again, like we talked about, sediment is the number one pollutant of water bodies. So by stabilizing your embankments, you can really start to uh, you know, get that water body back into shape. Um, when you're talking about socks, you're talking about, you know, thinking about car maintenance, you can think about, you know, making sure that you are basically <clears throat> cleaning off your undercarriage of your car, preventing rust. As you know, you want to keep that nice and clean so that your undercarriage and your things last for a longer period of time. Um, the next couple things we're going to talk about are mechanical type of solutions. Um, obviously, mechanical harvesting is a little bit different <coughs> than some of the other things we talked about, but again, it's a natural solution. So what mechanical harvesting does, as you can see, it's a pontoon system. It has a cutter on the front with a conveyor belt. And basically, you can think of this as almost cutting the lawn. Now, sometimes we, you know, Leslie talked about early on, sometimes treatment is the way to go. But then sometimes for permitting or other reasons, uh, you know, treatment might not be available. Uh, so mechanical harvesting basically goes in and targets and goes after those weed species. It really does great on those uh, floating weed species with a lot of biomass near the top of the water body, like water chestnut and some other, other weeds. Uh, basically, it's also great because you're removing that organic debris from the pond. So you're reducing some of that nutrient problem that you have uh, over time. Um, again, mechanical harvesting <coughs> is a great alternative uh, for chemical, uh, chemical treatment. Uh, and again, you know, we need to assess your water body to see whether the weeds are the correct weeds that this is going to work for. The next thing I want to talk about is mechanical uh, hydro raking. So again, hydro raking, again, uses a similar vehicle. It's a pontoon with, uh, it's a, a pontoon boat with uh, side wheels, so you can get very shallow water. You can actually see from this picture, we talked about using the material from this to fill the sock. So <laughs> if you saw that, he was driving it there by the shoreline and that was stuff was gonna be used to put in the sock. A hydro rake is uh, something that, again, it's a thing we have to permit. So, you, you know, depending on your jurisdiction, some places you have to permit, some places you don't. Uh, but basically it can target uh, unconsolidated sediment, muck, cattails, phragmites, other debris in your pond, can reach up to seven to 10 feet deep. Uh, again, we talked about that muck and organic debris being a, a, a really big, uh, a, adding a lot of uh, nutrients to the pond, which causes algae and some of your other problems. So this is a good way to, to kind of do it, a targeted maybe reset of that area. Um, you know, hydro raking, again, number one thing to remember is, might not be the best, uh, for, you know, for your pond, depending, may have a liner, you know, might be a permitting issue, but it's a great, way that you can uh, target some of those organic debris issues. And you, you can also use this before we talk about the next thing that we're going to talk about, which is dredging. Uh, hydro raking, you can think about as like maybe, a, a, you know, an engine tune-up, whereas uh, dredging um, is kind of like the, the final step. That would be like a total engine rebuild. So uh, dredging um, is a, is a, obviously uses multiple techniques. So you can see from the traditional dredging on the two pictures with the buckets uh, to the aqua uh, uh, hydraulic uh, dredging, which is the, the uh, picture on your right if you're looking at your screen. Um, dredging is something, again, that's kind of like the, the final thing to kind of reset your pond. So we talked about aquatic succession. So if your pond has built up a lot of debris, organic debris, had a lot of sediment input, uh, is really shallow, uh, dredging is kind of that final step. So again, number one thing with dredging is, is permitting, very important. Uh, you know, it's going to require permitting to get done correctly, but dredging, again, can give you some of that water depth back that you're looking for, remove a lot of that organic debris uh, that's causing the uh, nitrogen and phosphorus and other issues. Uh, and, you know, really kind of, like I said, is it's kind of like the last big step. By doing a lot of the other things we talked about before, we hope to maybe uh, avoid dredging or prolong dredging. Uh, but again, aquatic succession is kind of what happens over time when things get shallower and shallower. So dredging is the last natural solution that we're going to talk about because, you know, it's kind of like the, the final step and will help you reset your water body back to, you know, what it was when it was first built. So that's some of the 10 natural management solutions that we wanted to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Leslie and she can talk about how, we're, how we use all these uh, things in a holistic annual management plan. Leslie? Wow, Wes, that was incredible. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us.
it's just amazing for me to have people like Wes to fall back on because look at that wealth of knowledge in just a couple minutes. That was awesome. As promised, I'm going to quickly cover implementing a holistic annual management plan before we jump into our question and answer session. So implementing a holistic annual management plan. First off, we want to be proactive. Proactive management is key. It's keeping your lake or pond healthy and beautiful. Honestly, having a team of lake experts paired with a lake committee or a homeowner if it's a residential situation is wonderful. Communication is everything and your goals and dreams for your lake are most reachable with the right team by your side. It's important to integrate these solutions for a holistic management plan. For example, installing that aeration system that Wes talked about. Establishing a beneficial buffer will better protect your water body from water quality issues like algae and aquatic weeds. Again, communicating with your lake experts about what other avenues would be beneficial to your lake is a great idea. Maybe a fish stocking to help with mosquito control or the right fountain for a stagnant section of your pond. These are just ideas to get you thinking. When you picture your lake or your lakes, where do you see room for these opportunities? Solitude's experts can look at your specific water body and develop a plan that fits your needs. Like people and like lakes, no two water bodies are the same. I'll take just a minute to run through our platforms. The perks of annual management. Keeping your budget and water body needs in mind, we offer three different levels of annual management, premium, plus, and essential. All plans can include the natural management solutions from algae and weed treatments to shoreline weed control. We offer buffer management and eco-friendly dye treatments as needed. Every month, every customer will receive a report on what was done by your lake management team. With this, all plans are a commitment from us to you, helping you rest assured we are doing our best to exceed your expectations while communicating with you on any issues that might arise. Add-ons available to customize your plan. Of course, every situation is different and some plans might just need a bit more. Some add-ons include permitting assistance, nutrient recovery, and annual algae and ID testing. If you're really ready to kick up your feet and let your lake management team take over, we are ready to provide monthly fountain and aeration maintenance, annual in-person meetings with you, the client, or with the board members. Another thought, after discussing your budget, and your goals with your business development consultant, we will be able to provide you with a plan that fits your needs. We want to do everything we can to make this an easy and reliable relationship for you and your community. Last, but definitely not least, if you become a premium Solitude client, you do receive 5% discounts on products or one-time service for the life of your contract. We have dedicated professionals and a customer support team that are absolutely incredible. We have so much to offer beyond what you see on the surface, no pun intended. Not only do you have a dedicated business development consultant, just an email or phone call away, but that person is backed up by a team of experienced and expert field biologists, scientists, fish experts, a customer support team that's incredible, a company-wide support team so we can go above and beyond on those harder projects like requests for proposals, and every person on our team has a leader they can rely on to make sure we are doing everything we can to exceed your expectation. We offer water quality packages um, here at Solitude, and we recommend regularly scheduled water quality testing services to ensure that your lakes and ponds are in peak condition year round, especially if they're used for swimming, fishing, drinking, or irrigation. Our certified professionals are prepared to assess your lake or pond water for many variables from pH to dissolved oxygen, phosphates, ammonia, hardness, and much more. We invite you over to our website where you can explore um, a full list of everything that we can test for. Data helps us understand the current state of your water body. Following a water quality test, we will provide you with a wonderful, comprehensive report that gives you results of your water quality and recommendations and best solutions. Again, regular water quality testing provides many benefits to help you 
and your lake management team understand and determine solutions to stay ahead of water quality issues by not putting a short-term band-aid on the issue, but by finding solutions that will help enhance your water body for years to come and can help save you money in the long run. That wraps up this part of the webinar. Let's jump into your amazing questions that have been coming in. Before we do that, we'd like to put up another super quick poll just to see if you'd be interested in a free consultation. All you have to do is simply click yes or no. Just a friendly reminder, there will be a feedback survey at the end of the Q&A session where one lucky survey participant will receive a fantastic Solitude swag bag. All right, it looks like our first question has come in from Uda in Delaware. Uda asks, how can I best monitor silt deposits? Hey Uda, thanks for your question. Well, we start off with through uh, saying through proper measurements. One option is we could do a quantitative sedimentation study to give us a baseline and a timeline. This approach is done by using a variety of tools such as a sludge judge to take measurements of sediment throughout the lake and provide you with a map showing what depths were discovered and in what spots. Another more thorough approach would be a bathymetry study that you know, West covered earlier, which is just kind of a fancy way of saying a map of what's underneath, what's at, what's at the surf, uh, the bottom surface of your lake, the sediment, um, and that will provide us with a complete profile of what's going on on the bottom of your lake. One thing to always remember is dredging a lake is almost always something that will have to happen eventually. If your community is considering dredging, it's vital to have appropriate mapping done before and after so you know what you're working with walking into the project and what the results are following the dredging. This is something that we suggest clients stay ahead of so they can budget and be ready. One route that could be beneficial for controlling muck or to possibly prolong needing to dredge would be to add muck digesting pellets to your lake, which will eat away at the muck over time decreasing the amount of sediment in your lake. Following a dredge, we highly recommend clients implement a proactive management plan to stay ahead of water quality issues and prolong the water body lifespan. And one more last thought I'm having is making sure you keep an eye on what's happening in the environment around your lake. Landscaping could be playing a role in increasing sediment, such as grass clippings, they're a culprit. Make sure pet waste is being picked up around the lake and trash is being picked out. Try using fertilizer that has no phosphorus. Organics dropping into your lake also contribute. Algae growing in vine is another culprit to added sediment. With proper lake management, algae can be controlled as well as having more eyes and hands on the lake. Thanks again for your question, Uda. Wes, it looks like Mark in Colorado has sent in a question. Yes, Mark, uh, we got your question here. Are there other methods or products you can use to reduce bottom organics and associated algae blooms during the warmer months. So again, Mark, during the webinar, we talked about some of the best ways to do it. So the biological augmentation, um, biological augmentation, adding that a beneficial bacteria and those enzymes can really start to eat away at the bottom muck and have to cycle those nutrients through your pond so they're not available for the algae to use. Uh, again, adding aeration uh, to that, kind of supercharges that. Uh, anytime you're adding more dissolved oxygen, you're gonna uh, create uh, more habitat for that uh, beneficial bacteria to work on that muck at the bottom of your pond. And, you know, again, working on that muck, you're working on the fuel for those associated algae blooms. And again, like we talked about, when you get to a point where those things aren't working, you have the hydro raking, you have the dredging option. I know there's all, there are some other non-natural uh, solutions. Uh, there's uh, using peroxide uh, based uh, to basically lift the bottom or oxidize the bottom layer of that muck to help to lift it, get some of it up into solution and help to break it down uh, further. Uh, but again, I think that your best bet will be to stick to some of these natural things that we've talked about. Uh, Leslie, it looks like there's another question uh, for you from Beth. Great. Hi, Beth. It looks like uh, you are in New Jersey and you are asking, how can community members help support the health of the lake? 
Well, that's a fantastic question. And it really goes back to the environment, right? It, it depends on the setting of your lake. You wanna be aware of what's going on around your lake, what's going in your lake, what's being applied near the water and what could be washed into your lakes. The rule of thumb is if you don't want it in your lake, try not to put it in your yard near the lakes. Community members can help support the health of their lake by not feeding the animals. Often people think it's cute to bring the kids or grandkids down and feed the geese or ducks. The truth is feeding them increases their population, which increases their waste that can run back into the lake, increasing phosphorus levels and algae and weed blooms. Also having a lake management team that you can rely on is vital. Often communities want to take on caring for their lakes on their own, but finding a way to work with lake experts is your best bet so that you can know as a community how to best take care of your lake. Going back to my question with Uda, it's important to have a lake committee team in your community that has a proactive plan. Then have a delegated member of that team or maybe a property manager who is the main point of contact should you partner with a lake management company. Communication is key and always, again, just keeping an eye on what's going on around your lake. Wes, it looks like we have a question that's coming from Damon in Kentucky. Excellent. Uh, Damon, we received your question. What are a few plant species that are beneficial in buffer zones? Well, that's a great question. And that kind of gets back to one of the first things we talked about, which is assessment. Uh, so it's important that we also assess what you have in your buffer zone. Uh, you know, really, we like to use native plants. So we do lakes and water bodies across the country. So different plant species are going to be better depending on the situation. And that includes the location that you're at, but also topography, shade, uh, you know, water type. We, we deal with some water on the coast that, you know, is brackish, that we have some influence. So obviously those plants are going to, uh, you know, very, really vary based on the buffer that you have. Uh, you know, some buffers are around natural lakes or larger lakes or water bodies where trees and woody stem plants are great. Uh, a lot of the work we do are on stormwater management ponds or embankments that have dams that, you know, we can't have those species because they become a toppling risk and a structural risk. So we focus on more herbaceous plants. So my answer to you is I, I can't give you a specific great uh, plant for you. I will say a good safe bet if we're going to talk about plants are, are your grass species. Uh, so uh, you know, your little blue stem, your big blue stem, and your, your panic grasses, which there's multiple different species of those based on the situation. But those grasses are great because, again, they form a nice root mat, help to filter and stabilize your embankment. Well, it looks like the next question's for me as well, so I'll go ahead and continue. Uh, Georgia, New Jersey, how can I improve lake visibility? Well, if we're talking about water clarity or visibility throughout the water column, uh, that's how I'm going to answer the question. Uh, that's great. So a lot of the having a good holistic management plan in place is going to solve a lot of the clarity issues because a lot of times clarity issues are caused by algae blooms. Uh, so by a lot of the other natural management uh, solutions we talked about today, you can reduce those unicellular algae blooms that can create that cloudy water column, reduce visibility, um, aeration, et cetera. All those things can, can really help. But sometimes you also have a suspended solid situation or something that maybe you know, it's not going to be handled by uh, traditional uh, management techniques or even these natural techniques that we've talked about. So uh, a great thing for that is uh, alum, aluminum sulfate, and there's many different forms of alum, but alum basically uh, does a lot of those things we talked about with phosphorus. It's a flocculant, but it just doesn't attract phosphorus. It basically it, it attracts any of those suspended solids or any of the nutrients that are in the water column and helps to to sink them down to the bottom of your pond and get them out of suspension. So alum, uh, in, in conjunction uh, with some of the other methods we talked about, again, based on what you have in your, in your water column can really help to improve uh, water clarity. Uh, Leslie, it looks like we have a question from you from Robert in Pennsylvania. Great, hi Robert. Um, Robert is asking, how can I control cattails? That's such a great and popular question. First off, I'd say just schedule a visit with an expert to find the right plan of action. That might be a spray, it might be an herbicide. Um, if it's a spray, that would help with the plant. It would help the plant degrade within itself. And once the cattail absorbs the chemical, they become like a matchstick. Um, once the cattails are dry, we can cut and remove them. 
then I would say be proactive in managing any new growth. This can be done by pulling them out by hand as you see them. We use different products to control cattails before we remove them. This is one approach if the cattails haven't taken over too much. If the cattails have taken over, we would encourage the community to let us bring in our, our hydro rake or our aquamog, which is an aqua harvester. These machines operate on the water and use an arm to reach out, dig down, and pull out cattails, including root wads. Uh, Wes kind of covered those back a few slides ago when he was going through the 10 um, different nat natural management solutions. So it'd be good to go visit that again on different machinery that would help with the cattails. Um, however, it's important to remember that the cattails always leave seedlings behind. So there's never a one-time cure-all. It's an ongoing process, but we're happy to help with it. Wes, it looks like we just received a question from George in New Jersey for you. Yes, I have it here. George asks, uh, how do you suggest oxygenating a deep lake? Do you need more systems to cover it? Uh, well, George, it's actually a pretty popular misconception. Um, you know, the deeper the lake, uh, the more efficient aeration actually is. Uh, so it's really the surface acreage and shape of the lake um, that's going to determine how many systems that you need along with the depth. But for example, if you had a one acre pond that's 10 feet deep, you're going to need uh, uh, more aeration there than if you had a one acre lake that was 25 feet deep. Basically, the you know, aeration becomes more efficient because there's more lifting action. So you might need a higher horsepower or, you know, uh, you know, a stronger system to pump to some of those depths. But really, the uh, deeper the lake, the more efficient you can actually be with a lot of your aeration systems. Leslie, it looks like we have another question from you from Sally in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I see that. Hi, Sally. Um, Sally in Pennsylvania is asking, how can you prevent shoreline erosion? Um, first off, we want to make sure that that shoreline is stable. If you have loose ground and it rains, it's going to come loose and that's going to go into your lake. Uh, planting beneficial vegetation to help hold your shoreline together, which works in two ways. It secures your shoreline while adding beauty and beneficial environments. Again, um, Wes, you kind of touched on there isn't one plant that's going to work in Arizona that's going to work on the East Coast. So it's important to just communicate with an expert and get those, you know, professional um, outlooks on what would help, you know, pull your shoreline together with some beneficial vegetation. Um, we also have, uh, as Wes covered before, the fantastic shoreline restoration and prevention program called Sox Erosion Solutions. Um, the Sox systems can be used to construct a stable, long-lasting shoreline. And once in, play, uh, once in place, you can uh, plant grass and native vegetation and buffer plants directly into the knitted mesh, creating a really beautiful and living wall of plants or grass to enjoy for decades to come. Um, I hope that answers your question. If you have more questions on that, send them in. It looks like, uh, Wes, you just got a question from Todd in Florida. Yeah, Todd, uh, your question is, are there any are there other environmentally friendly, environmentally friendly solutions available to help target pests like aquatic weeds? Well, we talked about a lot of them today. We talked about, uh, you know, in certain situations with the triploid grass carp. We talked about, you know, uh, nutrient management. We talked about hydro raking. We talked about harvesting. Um, but in some situations, uh, some of the none of those might work. You know, there's other things we didn't talk about today. We you might be a dye that you could use in your pond to help reduce some of the uh, your pond weed growth, but that's a case by case basis. Uh, but another thing that, um, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes you have to use her herbicides to do the treatment. Now we pride ourselves on doing all the research for you and really going in and finding the best solution for you. Uh, again, we can use herbicides to really target those invasive species and those pond weeds that you don't want. Uh, there's a lot of uh, formula, new formulations, older formulations that do that. Uh, one of the newest tools in our, our tool belt is Priscilacor. Uh, so it's one of those things Leslie talked about earlier, it's a re reduced risk herbicide. I mean, we're talking about very little amount of herbicide going into your pond or lake, or lake. And it really, the uptake of it by those target plants is so quick that it's almost out of your water column, column as soon as we do the treatment. Now, plus there's older treatments that can be selective as well, like sonar, fluoridome products, which we can really dial in the right parts per billion that's going to treat your, your specific pond weed. But again, it, comes back to assessment 
and finding out what type of pond weed or what type of problem that you have and what your goals are. You know, some places that we do uh, in the Northeast, for example, we just want to get rid of the invasive uh, pond weeds. So, you know, we're really using a target of approach. And then when you're doing like a stormwater management pond where obviously volume and having that stormwater pond function right, you really don't want a lot of pond weeds, period. So you have to kind of target your, uh, you know, your solution based on the type of water body and what type of pond weed that you have. But it's a great question. Thank you so much. Uh, looks like the next question is uh, for you, uh, Leslie, but I'm going to help you out with it. Oh, really? Thank you very much, Wes. Um, yeah, well, it looks like it's from Chris in Virginia um, asking if we can explain what your process for water quality testing is and how often do you do it? But if you, uh, you feel like you want to take the microphone, it's all yours, Wes. Oh, I thought we were going to do the permitting one next. Oh, you know what? We are. We are. I was just kidding. That one, uh, I got them mixed up. My bad. <laughs> Megan in Florida, the permitting. Okay, what is the permitting process for a shoreline stabilization product, and will you help through the process? That is an awesome question. Um, you know, just from what I know, each state is different for permitting, but your team in Florida would most certainly help you with the permitting process if it's required, and anybody else listening in, we're always willing and ready to help you with your needed permits. Um, but Wes, now please take the microphone. Yeah, so just like just like Leslie said, just like a lot of these things, it really is a case by case basis. And, and in this case, it's a jurisdiction by jurisdiction. It could be state, uh, local, it could be even your Army Corps office that might cover multiple states, but have different kind of uh, you know parameters that they use. So we basically have to look at it on, on a case by case basis. Uh, some places when we're doing a natural shoreline on a large lake might be considered wetland. So you might need to go get a general permit and a wetland permit. Uh, sometimes if you're using this on a stormwater management pond, you might not need any permitting at all because it's a repair process. So it's really going to depend on a case by case basis. And again, that comes in with the different offices and the experts that we have, you know, working in your area to come up with the best solution for you. Um, permitting, again, can really be a hang, hang up on some of these things sometimes if you're trying to do it yourself. But that's why we're here to help you out and point you in the right direction. A lot of times we can help you get that permit. Sometimes we got to, you know, sometimes you might have to get some engineers and some engineering involved. And we, of course, have all those experts that we work with on a daily basis that can help you with that. Thanks, Wes. The next one is for me again. Uh, it's from Mark in South Carolina. He has another great uh, fisheries questions here. So which management solutions can help improve my fishery? So basically everything you saw today can help improve your fishery. Uh, when you're helping to improve your water body and your water quality in general, you're going to help to improve, the, you, you know, your fishery. Um, you know, when you're you have less harmful algae blooms and you're controlling, the, you know, some of those invasive aquatic weeds. When you're creating habitat with beneficial vegetation, when you're adding aeration, adding dissolved oxygen, so there's less stress on the fish. All these things can really help improve your fishery. You know, even those little mosquito fish can be good, good, uh, you know, bait fish for some of your other fish that you have in your pond. Uh, you know, your bass and your bluegills and your other game fish that you're going after. So my answer is that a lot of the solutions we talked about, basically improving your water quality is going to help improve your fishery. Now, if you wanted to get deeper and you wanted to have a, you know, a fishery that was managed for, let's say, having a high catch rate, if you wanted to have, you know, grandkids or kids or children get involved and have a good pond that you can catch a lot of bluegills and a lot of fish, you know, we can add structure and bait and, you know, model your fishery a little bit differently so you get a higher catch rate. You know, sometimes adding gravel beds, sometimes adding brush piles, uh, sometimes adding, you know, even artificial hab structures and habitat to your pond can increase and help your fishery. Uh, or even if you wanted to get a trophy bass where we're really going in and focusing on what fish that you have and pulling out some of the stuff so you can grow bigger, larger fish. Or we can even use supplemental feeding. So it really just depends on what your fishery goals are. But when I get asked this question all the time, I say, well, improve your water quality. You can improve, you know, improve your overall pond and, and lake health. You can improve your fishery. Leslie. All right. Thanks, Wes. Um, and yes, now I'm going to answer Chris's question in Virginia. And this will be our final question today because we are just running up to the clock. For those of you that we didn't get to, please just keep sending your questions in. And like I've said a couple of times, we will record a second Q&A and email that out to you next week. So Chris in Virginia asks, again, can you explain what your process is for water quality testing and how often do you do it? 
Hi, Chris, and thanks for this question. Um, I know I've touched on this a couple of times throughout the webinar, but I'll revisit. Um, water quality testing is so important and really provides us and you with a wealth of knowledge about what's going on in your water body. But I'd like to say there's one answer for every client that's just not the case. This would be an opportunity to meet with your lake professional and discuss the best plan for your lake or your lakes. I like to begin um, my new lake management relationships with a fully comprehensive water quality test, which we send into our labs where reports are then created that are not only easy to read, but they're easy to share. And they're very comprehensible and they um, have recommendations and solutions for your water body or water bodies there on them. Uh, following that initial test, we might suggest testing twice per year, quarterly or monthly, again, based on your individual needs. I like to use the metaphor of going to the doctor. It's so beneficial to give our doctors blood samples so they can see what's going on in our body. However, if the doctor never gets that blood sample and simply has to guess, it puts our health at risk. When we have a comprehensive report based on lab results, we can be confident on how to move forward. Um, and you know, guys, we're, we're really running up to the bell, um, the closing bell here. And we apologize again for those of you that sent in questions that we ran out of time to answer. We'll work on filming that second Q&A and get that to you by next week. I would like to thank my colleague, Wes, for his time and sharing his wealth of knowledge, of course, and most importantly, we thank you for joining us today. You're free to go and we wish you a happy and healthy spring.